Um, Dr. Sandra, I'm going to give you a presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I want to congratulate uh, Rizal Sukma and the team board of um, CSIS for this amazing building. I think um, this is unprecedented that the, uh, uh, um, a think tank that Bahal Hill correctly said that uh, there's not many of them uh, really have this just very modern, its own building. I mean, it's not many, so many important uh, institutions in Indonesia struggle with this. And so I want to congratulate uh, the board for uh, having this uh, um, commitment to support CSIS uh, and, and thus also us in the intellectual community in, in Indonesia. Um, and as a student, I used to come here, I think, you know, I spoke with some uh, people outside also, and we shared, we reminisced about how we used to go here. Uh, I used to come here every single day because OE didn't have enough working space for me as a, as a student writing my scripts at the time. And so I used to come here and just, you know, work in the library. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, I had the pleasure of working pa with Pak Pande, uh, Raja Silalahi, as my community in Tbilisi. Uh, and so CSIS has always been a very, very special place um, for me. And also Pak Hadi was one of the lecturers in, in the university uh, at that time. And all of the students, wide-eyed, um, you know, in awe to this handsome young man, a very clever lecturer, uh, which we didn't really have a lot of time. So I'm just very, very pleased and very, very uh, honored to, to be here uh, speaking in the Central Policy Forum and the Indonesia Update. Um, when I asked Riza Sukma what is it that he would like me to focus on, on this talk, um, he said, well, just talk about anything that has happened between your update, your 2012 update, uh, to now, uh, which is at that time it was a month ago I think, when he asked me, um, and I thought, well, how how boring, um, you know, six months. What are we going to be talking about? Um, cows? Are we going to be talking about the politics of cows? And um, there's really not that much that has happened. And I thought, well, maybe the the cute cows. You know, these are the two things that basically have happened in the last several months. And so I thought, this cannot be the focus of this 15 minutes discussion. So I um, thought that I, I would do the following. First, I will uh, revisit some of the main issues that I uh, discussed in the 2012 uh, political update, and I apologize for those of you, some of you probably uh, here, uh, who has uh, heard this presentation before. But I also then will try to think with you all, particularly in the discussion later, and determine whether the narrative is still relevant as we go through some of the current events. Um, in, the, in the 2012 update that I, I gave, um, I pointed out the fact that Indonesia politics and democracy, um, particularly around 2008, 2009, the writing, the main narratives about Indonesian democracy and politics is celebratory. It was, it was a celebration of the maturing of our democracy. No longer Indonesia was seen as democracy in waiting. By 2008, 2009, we are an established democracy. And um, I think today we still have the rights to actually still celebrate those victories of how we actually arrived where we were. Because I think we need to learn how did we do it? How did we do it as a nation to have arrived in the 2009 situation in which we had um, we had a, a very vibrant um, and, and promising democracy? The explanation, and, and by 2009, when Riza uh, Sukma gave his political update in ANU, his main uh, pay, one of the main ideas of his paper is talking about the explanation of the results of the election. Uh, so there's not, uh, it's, it's kind, it's very upbeat, 
um, and it is explaining what we saw in 2009 election. And by 2010, Greg Feely began to be more somber, and he's talking about the stagnating um, the nature of Indonesian democracy. Um, and by 2012, in the Indonesia update, update, then we started seeing how the use of regressing um, was used by, by, by Tomsa. Um, so how did we get from a growing democracy, an established democracy, to stagnating democracy and regressing democracy? And I thought um, it was not, sorry, Tomsa is 2011. And I thought that, you know, I, I don't really have a measurement, you know, I don't really have a, a, a measurement to actually check whether or not we're regressing, stagnating, two step back, one step forward, and so on and so forth. So, so I thought what we need to see is to understand why. Why, why are we regressing? Why are we stagnating? And my main um, thesis in, 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 in my piece is that I think one of the most, if not the root causes of the stagnation and regression of Indonesian democracy is the lack of accountability. I'll talk to you through. I'll talk you through about uh, of this on this issue. This is really the main uh, keyword in in my presentation is about political accountability. I think we all agree that elections in Indonesia have been successful. It has been peaceful despite the dwindling uh, uh, rate of voters turnout. You know. For the most part, yes, there were some uh, events in Bali in which there was some clash, but for the most part, I think the, by now, I think since, two, since the beginning of this year until this month, 90 million voters were, were uh, involved in the elections in the different provinces that we have had in Bali, in Central Java, in Sumatra Selatan, in North uh, Sumatra. You know, by and large, they are peaceful. But however, we also uh, see, I think, uh, the, the consensus is that election has not been able to be used by voters as a way to agree or disagree with their elected officials. It has been very hard, if not impossible, for voters to actually demand accountability. Let alone accountability, it's very hard for us voters to to really understand the ideology and the platform and the programs and what it is what is it that political parties actually fight for in their agenda. And my my uh, position is that it is because coalitions that have been formed in these different political uh, contestations have been random and have not been. Um, uh, have not been actually explained to voters uh, the, the different coalitions that have taken forms in the different uh, elections, national and local. Uh, so this, I'm also talking about the local election. So I'll talk you through just very quickly about why coalitions are formed. Why is it that there are political coalitions, uh, uh, coalitions of political parties? There are three main things that we usually hear. First is to fulfill the minimum of threshold of nominating, to, to nominate candidates. Second is to win elections. The, the argument is that you know, the more political parties you have, the likely you are to win elections because these political parties have their constituencies. And if elected, and this is uh, what 2009 Rizal Peace talked about, just to, to maybe to make sure that they can govern effectively. So these are the main, uh, supposedly, reasons why coalitions are formed. Let's look at them one by one. Is it really to fulfill the minimum threshold of nominating candidates? So currently, we have um, we have now the uh, le the legislation currently, but, but this is being being revisit revisited in the presidential uh, legislation. Currently, we have 25 percent of votes or 20 percent of seats in the uh, political parties can nominate. Uh, there is a threshold, and I believe Hannah uh, just told me that Garindra has already uh, said that if there is a threshold, they will take it to constitutional court. So it is likely that this threshold is going to be uh, is going to be uh, taken off the, the legislation. So it'll be interesting if without threshold, people will still be having these coalitions. And the second one is uh, the second reason why coalitions form. They say is to win the, the election. 
Well, elections in Indonesia have shown the different uh, the different um, uh, local elections have shown that this is just not true. There is no uh, there is no solid evidence that can say that there is an association between voters and political parties. In fact, you know the many surveys, including the CSIS that uh, Rizal asked me to uh, where is Rizal? Rizal asked me to mention. Uh, we can see that there's a very dwindling, it's too light of a word to actually explain uh, the rate of voters not wanting to be associated with political parties. So there's very little association. In the presidential election, we, we saw that politi up to s political parties that do not support President Bibiwana lost about 65% of their constituencies. So there is no relationship between uh, winning the election and uh, getting a, a large coalitions. And um, I'm so glad that pa 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 Fauzi Bo is no longer here. Um, I think his election really, I was, I was afraid uh, that he was still here. Because, but I think, I think his election really has shown that, you know, that's just not the case. Just because you have a large coalition really do not mean that you would win the election. And then number three is, there's this thinking that if you win, um, if, you, if you're elected, then, then, then it will make sure that you can govern effectively. Well, you know, in, in, in 2009, Rizal said the coalition is a way to provide stability and support in the parliament. And I think, you know, rightfully so. That was just right after the election. And then we started to see the problems, as I mentioned earlier. Tom Sapp pointed out the problem, Bank Century, and all that kind of stuff. And then by 2011, President Yudhoyono, uh, you know, insisted on having a platform, an agreement with political parties, which what it says is that it means that he cannot actually really control the coalitions that he had. That, that means that he can't really govern effectively simply because he, can, he has this coalition. And I think by 2012, we can ask ourselves whether or not this agreement that the 2011, every day in the newspaper, we heard about this agreement in the, uh, for, for the coalitions. Uh, is it really being upheld? And I don't think so. I mean, we can, today in the newspaper, Pekka is insisting again to get out of the coalition. It's the same story for how many years already. So it really does not help the government to govern effectively. Then why then? What, so I think what we have left then is what is the unintended consequences of this of this coalition? What are the incentives? I cannot really get into the heart and mind of these political party leaders to ask why we are making these coalitions. But what we can do is we can look at the incentives as to what is it that they get out of these coalitions. But meanwhile, as we think this through, as the, as academic and political activists are thinking about this through. You know, coalitions continue to be formed. They are built under spotlight, but very little explanations to voter. And there has been thousands and thousands of permutations in this uh, in this coalition building. And I'm going to use the example of Jakarta election. And again, I'm so very pleased that about, uh, Fokker is not here anymore. But if you look at Jakarta poly, uh, by the time Jakarta went to the polls in uh, 2012, they have seen this many permutations. This is including the presidential election uh, as well. So I'm not going to read this to you, but I just want to show you, and this table is available in the, in the article in, in the bulletin. But my point here is that by the time they went to the poll in 2012, they have seen the permutations of practically every political party with every other political party. So there is really no guidance for them to say, if I vote for, say, Peggy and Pei, you know, they will do this, they will, they will, you know, this is their agenda. These are the political parties with whom they're going to be quality, making coalitions. Um, uh, the only uh, political parties that have not been in a coalition together in Jakarta, in Jakarta election, is Pei uh, and PKS. And my sense is that it is mainly because they're strong enough and so they can go at it by themselves instead of having to perform the coalition. But other than that, all political parties have been with, with everyone. So, as I said, there's no ideology, no common agenda. For voters, this is my point, it is very hard for them to get a sense of the, 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 the identity of these political parties. The unintended consequences, however, is for the political parties to be able to distance themselves from problems. 
And I would suggest that this is really one of the main incentives uh, for political parties to be together and not go at it by themselves because they can, uh, for lack of a better word, duck problems, you know, and the problems thrown at them, they can say, that's not my decision, that's a political, other, other political party in my coalition decision. So there's an incentive there. And I want to bring to one, just one uh, case study of the rising intolerance in Indonesia. We saw last year the most bloodiest one in Sampa. Um, in which with death and, and wounded people, and up to now, hundreds of people being displaced. And it's very hard for us, and particularly for people in Sampang, to actually really understand who is responsible for this, who is actually taking action. Um, is really relocating them as a way to provide safety? Is it really? Uh, but what about this whole issue of displacement? And I think what we can see is that it's sending mixed messages. At the beginning, President Yudhoyono admitted that there was a failure of intelligence, that this issue could have been, this problem could have been um, avoided, that there was a, a failure in intelligence. However, as we know, the Minister of Religion said that, um, yeah, but we need dialogue, and you know what, the best way to solve the problem is for the Shia to convert to Sunni. And he went on public saying this. So, we as voters um, are left with the situation in which what is really the government's position in this issue? Who's really responsible for this issue and where do we go to get action? These contradictions really confuse voters. Um, and this happened, and we can, we can multiply these issues by a hundred folds, um, and there were just many different um, messages being sent to people. At the end of the day, the political, the administration, both in the national level, and I'm also talking about some examples in the local uh, elections, is that there's no one left responsible for real problems facing real people in, in Indonesian uh, politics, i.e. voters really cannot get accountability from the elected leaders. And so what's going to happen in 2014? Um, I think we will see still random coalitions. The signals that we have read in the newspaper, uh, several times we have seen, oh, tunggu aja nanti hasil, you know, just wait for the legislative election result, whether or not we can uh, nominate our own uh, jaguar, you know, our, we can jockey our own candidate. Uh, and if not, we'll look, we'll look into, yeah, maybe other political parties, so, yeah, we'll, we'll make coalitions. It's so likely said. And, we are never really under being, you know, given explanations. We are brought together because what, you know? And, and so I think it is too, coalitions are made without strong reasons that are, for voters, it's easy for them to digest and easy for them to understand why those coalitions are made. Where is the hope? Where then, so if that is the case, and if already, already I said that the coalition is really the, the biggest problem that we have facing 2014 as well in terms of promoting better democracy, accountable democracy, uh, in which voters can actually use elections to install and to take elected officials from the office. So where, where is the hope then? Where, where is our hope? I think the hope is really, um, on the one hand, among the engaged civil society. Uh, going to 2014, I think, you know, we, we, as in all of us, um, as well as the uh, leaders of civil societies outside, and really have to think about understanding, unpacking these coalitions. Because I think that's one of the ways in which we can understand the dynamic, the incentive. We can understand whether, and, and also later on able to hold these uh, politicians accountable. And the other hope, and I know this is a little bit weird to be thinking about this, but I think maybe the hope is in the political parties. And there's a big maybe there. I'm trying to get a bigger font than that, but um, I think that's big enough. Um, why did I say political parties might be uh, might be the, the, the hope? Is uh, in which case then my number one concern, which is random coalitions, perhaps will be less. Maybe political parties will already have learned right now um, from the Jakarta elections, in which they have, you know, Jokowi came in with very limited coalitions, 
won the election um, and um, really able to show that when, when you have a clear agenda, when you don't confuse voters, one with using religious issues and the other one using this issues and that issue, your coalition's sending mixed and contradicting messages to the voters. When you don't have that, when you have clear agenda, actually voters vote for you. And Joe Bowie has already shown that. And I think if political party were to learn about that, then I think there's hope for Indonesian voters to uh, understand, to cast the ballots in a more in a more meaningful way. They will be able to attribute success or failures. You know, come the next election in Jakarta, we know, we can tell whether or not we will install Jokowi again, or we will take him out of office because you know, it is Jokowi's administration. Yes, it is with Gerindra as well, but you know, it's PDP and Gerindra. It's very limited coalition. I think we can then attribute success and failures to these two political parties in Jakarta. And so when I'm talking about Jokowi, it is not necessarily about Jokowi, the 2014 MP candidate, uh, but it really is about the phenomenon of Jokowi that perhaps would allow 2014 a different kind of politics, a different kind of um, uh, electoral politics uh, that, that Indonesia can have. And with that, I think I, I stopped by, by saying that we're all, I think, looking forward to 2014 election and, and, and for what result it, the result it may be, I, I, take, I invite you to see the CSI survey. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, we will go straight to our um, economic updates and then we'll have a few session right after the, um, the, the two speakers finish. Uh, thank you, moderator of the MPP. Um, yes, uh, when the result asked me uh, to, to uh, deliver the economic update in this event, uh, I, I agree uh, uh, immediately at the time. Because this is really an honor for me. Uh, I'm one of the most, uh, one of the first speakers uh, using this new auditoriums of our building, uh, a, a, a very nice ones. Uh, the one, uh, the one that just uh, ready actually yesterday. <laughs> so, so, I'm, so I, 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 was, I, I was very delighted uh, uh, to the request. But after that, uh, I was a little bit confused. Uh, what should I deliver in the an economic update? I'm not an economist that follow economic uh, news, economic issues every day, like like economists in the bank or in the central banks, because because my my uh, my specialization is actually in the uh, international trade and regional integrations. Uh, so when we're talking about economic update, it's usually a very broad, uh, very broad and vast uh, issues that we need to look at. And unlike Sandra here, uh, who also speak, uh, spoke in the, uh, in the uh, e e economic up uh, political update at the AU last September, I didn't have that kind of opportunity. Unfortunately, Pak Budi Exeter Sansono haven't uh, really invited me to come to Canada to talk about the economic update. So I, start, I should start from, from a, a zero point uh, uh, with nothing to have. But anyway, let, let me start to look at the, uh, at least what I already gathered so far uh, and share my view on uh, some issues of economic uh, aspects of uh, today. Uh, this, uh, let me start with the, uh, uh, some good news, perhaps, uh, some good aspects that we can see uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the economic uh, areas uh, at the moment. First, uh, we now at the global level, so uh, at least some of the uh, economists who follow these uh, these issues um, uh, believe that there, there are now uh, three uh, speed recovery. 
the, 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 the economy, three states may possibly because because uh, now we're not number only talking about strong and emerging markets and developing economies, uh, but now we also have some growth in the U.S. Uh, economy. Although uh, uh, in the Euro we still see negative and very uh, weak growth. Uh, perhaps I should also um, add a little bit about about Japan here. So it's not it's not it, it's not a three speed recovery, but perhaps a three and a half because we still don't know what uh, Japan will uh, go uh, the, the development in Japan will go. Um, so this is basically what's happening uh, uh, in the global uh, area. I, I I'm not going to talk. Um, uh, in details about that, you, know, you, you can you can go to the IMF website or to the ADP website to look at uh, more details about what happens already in the, uh, in the global economy. Um, in the uh, Asia Pacific, it's uh, it remains to be the engine of uh, global growth. Uh, the Asia Pacific, for example, last year uh, contributed around 40 percent of global growth. Uh, and the developing economies, including China, grew 6.2% uh, in 2012, uh, a big progress uh, to what happened in 2011. Um, and the first quarter data also saw strong conditions, although a bit weaker than expected. Uh, China, for example, grew only by 7.7, uh, so a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, slower than uh, everybody expected. Uh, well, more advanced economy in the regions performed somewhat below expectations as well, like Korea, uh, Singapore, uh, Taiwan. They, they accept, uh, they, they have they have positive growth, but uh, still not uh, not as uh, satisfied as uh, it should be. Uh, but uh, uh, rather different stories uh, come up uh, from Asian countries. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it continues to science, uh, underpinned by robust domestic demand, capital inflows also, and international trade. And uh, I don't know whether it is an unfortunate or fortunate for us. Uh, uh, looks like Indonesia is no longer the winner, the, the pioneers among Asian countries, uh, because Philippines now has, be, has become a new rising star with 6.8% uh, growth in the first quarters and then uh, uh, also become a new darlings in the, uh, in the financial markets. Although we still need to see whether it, uh, it is a, 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 a sustainable development or not. So let's see uh, Indonesia uh, so situations. Also, we still have a lot of good news in Indonesia. Uh, at least we, at least we have, uh, we still have a, a, a growth remain very strong, remain very strong, uh, and uh, we, as you can see, Indonesia has stable growth, uh, stable economic growth uh, during the last uh, four years. Uh, unlike many other countries in the uh, in the region, such as China, India, and also Malaysia, as comparisons here, so we still expect Indonesia also to uh, to uh, have a positive growth so this year. And inflation is also still within the high markets, although uh, lately a little bit soaring, uh, but still uh, it, uh, it's uh, it's under control. Um, uh, the investments also grew quite strongly. Uh, the, 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 although the uh, foreign direct investments uh, it's a little bit uh, slowing down uh, for the first, uh, the, the last quarters of last year and the first quarters of this year, but we still uh, can see that uh, these investments can uh, uh, can be one of the source of growth. So. Uh, so enough for the uh, big news, uh, for the good news. Uh, I think we need to be uh, to get to uh, more realities and then uh, talk a little bit more about the challenges, the 
challenges that perhaps would uh, come up uh, in this years and also uh, uh, next years in the election years of uh, uh, of Indonesia, big election years and uh, the, the time where uh, everybody is already expected since uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, it's, it's funny and it sits every five years, but uh, everybody already expect the, the the next election since the four since four years before it happens. Uh, uh, some I think some something's wrong with the Indonesian political system here. Um, anyway, let's see the challenges, and then I try to make it uh, less boring. When, when we're going to the, an icon, a seminar on economy update, normally people, uh, normally the presenters only come up with the tables and, uh, and a lot of graphics. I try, uh, see, I try to not to follow that, uh, that uh, uh, directions because I don't have uh, the capacity also to, to look at all those uh, graphics. Um, I try to just to uh, classify some challenges and I think in my opinion are quite uh, quite important and crucial and then try to put those into two dimensions uh, uh, dimension uh, uh, perspective. The first one is so looking at the uh, put the the uh, factors, the challenges into the impact of the economy when something happens. Uh, when when it can't, uh, it reaches the levels uh, that may might uh, uh, be harmful to the economy, and the the, the, the other direction, the other direction here is the probability of those uh, uh, factors also reach the the level that might be harmful to the uh, the, uh, the economic growth in the future. So uh, this this is the there are several factors. I, I, I uh, think in my opinion is uh, quite important. This is not an exhaustive list uh, for sure. Uh, you can put many other stuff and then uh, uh, we can discuss it again. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the position also is still, uh, still under, uh, it's still based on my observations. It's not, it's not a, a rigorous study where I can, uh, I come up with uh, indicators with a lot of weight and uh, uh, all, all those analysis. Um, so I put the, the impact, the, the high impact factor to the economy on, uh, on uh, the first one is uh, on the structural factors that might be unfavorable to group. It's uh, infrastructure conditions uh, and also perhaps uh, low skip paper and then also uh, fiscal burden to the energy subsidy. Uh, or, but, uh, but fortunately for us, the probability of those factors perhaps to to have the, the economic growth is uh, quite low. Uh, still, uh, can be uh, can be bearable by the economy. Um, uh, on the other hand, there is also uh, some probabilities, uh, some some factors that might be uh, that might have a high probability in having growth, uh, but they have a low impact to the economy. For example, on the inflexibility of labor market. Uh, and also the uh, 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 of more, mostly political factors, but the, it's uh, the, the social discontent due to income inequality and economic disparity perhaps uh, can uh, can be quite likely to happen uh, in uh, in the medium or uh, longer term futures. Uh, while there are also some other factors like uh, the restrictive. Uh, trade and investment regulations, uh, also infrastructure regulations that also give a uh, high impact to the economy and it's pretty uh, much uh, has moderate uh, uh, probability in, I mean, in the uh, medium terms. So, okay, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, about the about all those factors because I still have uh, I don't know ten minutes left for me. So I, I I'm going to use it for, to look at one of uh, uh, each one. Not all of them, so, uh, only one that I I, uh, I think sounds quite impo uh, quite important. Um, first on the structural factors. The infrastructure conditions. I I get it here from the World Bank publications. We all know that Indonesia still have problems with the lack of infrastructures. We've been discussing it for years. Uh, the 
the I, I don't know how, uh, now uh, the, the, the Malaysians, what is the number of uh, infrastructure summit? Maybe already the eight or the seven, uh, but still we're still talking about the lack of infrastructure. But uh, surprisingly, the economy still can cope up with the with the lack of infrastructure. We still can we still can live with with uh, 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 low energy capacity. We still can live with the, with the uh, very bad road conditions and also uh, bad infrastructure, uh, logistic infrastructure. So that, that's why I put it into the low risk factors uh, to the economy of hampering growth. Because, because although it's, it's, it's big now, we, we still can catch up 6.5% uh, so, uh, economic growth. So, uh, Perhaps somebody also can, uh, we can also discuss about it, why we, why we uh, uh, these problems uh, exist, went uh, around, uh, uh, but still cannot, uh, 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 we, we still can cope with, uh, with the problems. Okay, and then also the labor characteristics, uh, the one that I mentioned before, we still have a uh, very low uh, labor, uh, lab, uh, uh, low skilled labor, uh, low skilled intensive labor, uh, both in manufacturing, in services, and in, 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 in the other economic sectors as well. Um, the second, the second factors that I would like to highlight here is on the uh, fiscal revenues to the energy subsidy. Uh, as you know, energy subsidy has been discussed also for quite some time. Uh, 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 Professor Harkin mentioned this morning that uh, one of the most influential books from uh, Pak Hadi uh, was written in 1980s or 1970s. Uh, and it's about energy. But then uh, he talked also about energy subsidies, so it's 20, 30 years ago. And uh, we still have uh, this energy subsidy, uh, and even occupied the big part of our budget. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the amounts have been becoming as, uh, extremely large. In 2012, although we only put 137 uh, trillion dollars for the uh, fuel subsidy, in realization, it's uh, on, on uh, 35 percent, uh, sorry, it's 75 percent higher, uh, which 211 from uh, from fuel subsidy alone. This year, um, uh, the, 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 the the budget, the, the yeah, the budget for the, the 2013 uh, proposed to have uh, less than 200 trillion dollars as uh, fuel subsidy, but. Uh, the estimate, this comes from the estimations uh, from the Minister of Finance, the, the Minister of Finance uh, mentioned that it can reach uh, up to $300 trillion. It's uh, more than a, a quarter of the budget, the government budget. So it, it's, it's, it's very big and, uh, and, and it becomes a, a heavy burden to, the fiscal, uh, to our fiscal policy because, because now we no longer have the fiscal uh, policy space uh, using the fiscal. What happens if, if the, uh, the uh, uh, economic, global economy is not recovered? Then we are going to have more uh, external shock. We no longer have a policy space, of a fiscal policy space, to, uh, to use fiscal policy. Yeah. Um, as you, as you said, IS uh, uh, did uh, uh, a small study on, the, uh, on this uh, subsidy, on this energy subsidy, uh, uh, to, to contribute to the debates uh, over the uh, energy subsidy. And then we found, we come up with three scenarios um, well, well the, my, uh, our uh, proposal is to have a scenario 3 to increase the price to 6,000 and then gradually increase the price of fuel by 10% per year. So then the subsidy will be eliminated in 2020. Uh, we, uh, we, try to, uh, we try to incorporate 
the, uh, the increase in demand, the increase in the consumption also try to uh, predict the, uh, the oil, uh, oil price fluctuations and then we come up with the, this, uh, uh, the third scenario. This is actually the most feasible one because um, if we uh, stay with the current price, then uh, the subsidy will reach at least 550 trillion, uh, or, or almost the, uh, more than the uh, doubles of the current budget uh, proposals for the for fuel subsidy load in 2020. Um, and, uh, and, and, and if the government should, be not, should not hesitate to increase the price, because now, uh, I, um, in my opinion, public already uh, uh, already understands, already accept this reality. The latest uh, CSIS national survey, the one that uh, uh, we mentioned, have been mentioned uh, quite often this morning, uh, also includes some questions on the subsidy, on the energy subsidy, and we found out that uh, one question is. Uh, 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 try to capture the, the perspective of the, 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 the people's perspective on this uh, price increase, the fuel price increase, and, and it reveals that 62% of the population, at least the one that uh, we have been surveyed, doesn't mind to have a price increase as long as enough supply uh, to the, uh, uh, of a fuel enough supply of fuel available, uh, especially in the regional, uh, in other regions of the countries. But uh, we, have, uh, we also found out that only 10% of populations actually aware of the problems with the budget. So the government still needs a lot of uh, uh, explanations, uh, information, dissemination on, on what, the, uh, what is at stake at the moment with the uh, uh, with the uh, high energy subsidy. Okay, um, let's move to another uh, factors, another as aspect. Uh, the, the other aspect that I'd like to highlight here is the, the rising of uh, increasing economic nationalism. Uh, it's more or less uh, related to the political situations, in my opinion, because uh, uh, as you can see, uh, there are many protective and inward-looking uh, trade policies, uh, and also more restrictive investment policies uh, that you can find in many um, uh, many regulatory uh, uh, regulatory instruments uh, in Indonesia. It might be temporary uh, due to political uh, noise, political factors, because because uh, everybody wants to win the heart of people. So one of the easiest way uh, to win the heart of the population is to come up with more populist and nationalistic uh, uh, regulations. So, uh, the, uh, but it can have serious impacts, although, although it might not be uh, related to ideology, not really uh, come from the genuine, uh, uh, genuine uh, purpose uh, of having more uh, a nationalistic uh, uh, sentiment and nationalist, uh, nationalistic uh, situation, but it can have such an impact. And uh, there is also a tendency uh, for policy makers to make them more permanent. Like what happens uh, in, the, in several uh, proposed laws that tend to become more, uh, tend to be more restrictive than before, and uh, and it, uh, and it, it, it becomes it, it, it becomes permanent to uh, to appear in the uh, in the law of the state, then it makes it, it very difficult to retract. So that's what uh, that's what uh, 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 make me worry a little bit. Uh, it's, it might be temporary, it might be uh, 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 ungenuine, but it's uh, easy to make them permanent and then we can regret it later. Okay, the, the other aspects that I also need to uh, highlight here is the inflationary pressure of the current account deficit. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sorry. Mm. This is the questions from uh, worsening external balance. As you can see, as 
sini uh, there is big drop uh, in uh, export everybody already talk uh, how the current uh, uh, trade balance uh, Indonesia's trade balance has been worsening for quite a while and then uh, the drop uh, in export uh, although so far it can be con uh, can be compensated by the flows of capital uh, uh, through the direct investments and also portfolio investment uh, but it has uh, but it has some uh, uh, negative, uh, uh, big risk in the, in the financial side, putting the inflationary prices because of this capital, uh, the, the, the uh, possibility of capital outflow, capital, uh, capital run, capital flight in the future. Um, and, uh, and the drop in exports, uh, many see the drop in export as simply as the uh, because of because of the uh, 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 drop in commodity prices, global commodity prices. But unfortunately, if we look at the data, the more uh, the more detailed data, actually uh, a reduction in, uh, in export, the, the drop in export is across the board. Not only on the commodity, not only because of the uh, because of the uh, price change, but also because of other uh, other factors that we need to uh, uh, pay more attention. It includes uh, uh, competitiveness of Indonesia and also the demands of the, uh, the uh, weaker demands of the destination uh, destinations of export. Um, yeah. Okay, I have been warning to not uh, to uh, exceed two minutes of my time, uh, and I'm not going to bother you to, uh, for longer. I only need to uh, uh, put uh, to highlight a little bit about the social discontents due to income inequality and economic disparity. Uh, as you, you can see here, Indonesia has been uh, placed as having more middle class, uh, less. Uh, uh, poverty rate, uh, but less and less uh, uh, population to live below, below poverty line. But unfortunately, the income inequality is also increasing. Uh, we need to pay more attention here because this is also, uh, especially during the, uh, during the election year, uh, it can be used as, a, as one of um, uh, an issue that might be uh, 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 might be a benefit to one side of uh, one side of the political uh, or, 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 or or a political element in Indonesia. Um, the income inequality is increasing, uh, and then the the, the the labor market inflexibility is the one the regulation of, of the labor market also makes the situation, in my opinion, uh, a little bit worse because uh, it, it, uh, it also hampered the developments of uh, the sectors, the, un the unskilled labor intensive sectors that we still need uh, to give a job, to give employment to more, uh, most of the population. So uh, before closing my, uh, my update here, my update, uh, I just want to uh, give a key message uh, that, that perhaps uh, uh, try to summarize all of these things. Uh, we, we don't want to have all those uh, highlighted factors to become the high impact, high risk factors. And uh, I think it's the government of Indonesia still have a, a, a chance, still have authority and power uh, to act uh, more, uh, to act and more decisively take us uh, 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 of this possibility. And but it has to be based on market principles. Uh, it has also uh, to be based on the principles of uh, increasing private sector participation. Um, the politically motivated decision might be tempting uh, for the government and also for, for, uh, for the parliament. Uh, but keep, please keep it within economic rationals, even if you want uh, uh, to put more political motivations in, in, in the decision. And, uh, and if that's not also possible, please don't make them permanent. Just make them uh, as, a, as a sweetener for your political uh, uh, political motivation. Thank you very much. Thank you to our two speakers. Uh
Um, it's been interesting, a um, lot of um, issues recovered, but I think one um, important factor is that we see how interconnected um, political issues and economic issues are in Indonesia. Um, we have uh, plenty of time for discussions. So I'll open the first round of um, questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am. I think you can use the mic, yes. I'm not going to pose a question to my boss. So I just want to say it to you. Lisa, um, excuse my sort of knowledge on the economy, but then I'm very really intrigued with your uh, take, uh, your scheme, and put uh, high corruption in the middle. I mean, it's, it means like a minimum impact to economy and a medium impact to hampering the growth. So I don't see that if that is the analysis, it also means that there's almost no incentive to combat corruption because it has been an impact to anything. And I was sort of expecting that maybe corruption also pose distortions to the economy, but it seems that it's not really the case either. So from my perspective, I've been mean, working a lot on combating corruption, so I've been mean, making sure that looking looking at how corruption really uh, sort of sort of kill people basically if you, if, if uh, our uh, health services really can't sort of provide all the necessary medications because of the corruptions. I really see that from the bigger sort of like uh, pictures. Um, it will be very hard because from the political sort of like side as well. I mean, we don't really see any disincentive from not doing corruptions. There's been more incentive from doing corruptions if the economists also put it there in the middle. So I really have no hope, yeah. Thank you. I'll take a couple more. Yes. Sir uh, you don't want to ask the boss highway. <laughs> so, but uh, you mentioned that there is no uh, relationship between uh, political party and uh, winning uh, vote. But don't you think between now and 2014 there will be some change? Don't you think that the political party will learn about their fail? They still have time right now. And is there any indication uh, on doing so? And the other thing is that I just want to ask your opinion between now and uh, 2014. Do you think that there are much scope for uh, economic policies uh, during the period? Yes, I Thank you. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you mentioned about social discontent and also inequality. I think it is uh, resulting from the fact that our economy is going on a two-speed economy. The upper class is going faster. The lower economy is slow. And the gap between the two is widening. So I think inequality is the biggest danger. It is even more dangerous than poverty itself and unemployment. Because our nation becomes the nation of the half and the nation of the half not. And if this is continuing and it's not dealt with properly, well, it will see what happened in the Middle East. The Arab Spring. So, we feel it. You mentioned inequality, but what is the size, actually? The number you know, that is in the upper class and the lower class, because this is, I think, a structural problem in our society and very dangerous. Thank you. I can take one more. Yes. Thank you. My question to Pakistan. Um, you mentioned about the uh, restrictive trade and investment uh, regulation. It's becoming more nationalistic. Uh, my question is whether this uh, this trend is rational or irrational. Uh, I mean, as a, a 
as an uh, Indonesian uh, uh, corporation or Indonesian economy, they understand that when you have a uh, declining uh, external demand, um, this become tougher for them to compete with the other countries. In addition, it is a lot of to be said about the low level of competition strength of the uh, Indonesian product or Indonesian services uh, to be uh, competed abroad. So uh, this this one factor. Another factor is that many people now say that uh, the market is in Asia and the market especially also in Indonesia. So it is rational to look into the domestic market to be uh, successful. And I understand that from the conceptual perspective, it is, it is good to have an open and uh, trade and investment regime, investment regulation. But under the current situation where the, this trend in Indonesia or maybe in other Asian countries can be said to be rational or irrational. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have four questions already. Um, Sandra, would you like to start? Mm. Um, uh, how political parties learn? Is there still time in which we can um, have that candle of light <laughs> um, so that the flame won't go out at all? Um, I think that flame is flickering. Um, I think there is still hope, but you know what is the basis for for that hope? I think if we see what has happened um, in the local elections, um, uh, you know you still see this very um, random um, mix match, matching of different political parties. So I don't think that's going to change um, for now. Which, as I said, you know has consequences over the voters not being able to uh, hold their political uh, officials accountable. Um, however, you know, we do have, according to the survey, right, 28% I mean, of people undecided, right? So if you were running a political party, one would think that you would be trying to get that 28%, it's pretty high. Uh, of, of people undecided, and I think the CSI survey has shown that uh, whether or not it is seven candidates, whether or not it is 28, uh, four candidates, and you know, head to head. There's an echo here. Oh, I know. And so I think you know when when you uh, when you have that, it's still around 27, 28 people undecided. And so um, definitely there are, there are people out there that is just waiting for political parties to get their act uh, together and, and really come forward as as a party with, with agenda and with um, with uh, that have yet to make these undecided voters people who have not been actually uh, voting in the last couple of years in the local elections as well. And, then, and remember, the voters are not really is also dwindling, right? And so, um, and it's not just about, and I disagree with people who are talking about this in, 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 and frame it in, in, in apathy. I think Indonesians are engaged in political discourse. They just don't have the choice. That what's being offered to them were not something that they would feel inspired to actually vote for. So just because you have a low voter turnout, I don't think it is about apathy, or at least not not just about apathy. Now, um, so you have you have people who are undecided, and you would think that political parties would actually try to do this. However. If you look at the public, you know, discourse that that, have, that are available out there that you can actually check for yourself, I have yet to see political parties to actually, you know, give us reason to believe that yes, they are actually going to be that the political parties that are going to be pushing for, you know, allowing accountability where they if they are selected. 
elected. Uh, in, that's in the public discourse. Hannah and I work also with several political parties, particularly those who are you know, in, in, on the issue of women political participations. But we, because of our work, also hear uh, a lot of the insights from these political parties. And we can see I mean, the recruitment is really public. We know this, right? But the political parties recruitment is what is it, ad hoc, um, um, and just don't, they don't have the strategy of really, real good political parties recruitment. And so, you know, if you look at then the DPR uh, or political parties playing representational role as well as legislating role, you see that I think for the last several years, we've seen not a very good uh, performance from, from, from their part. And so, Will they learn? And as I said in my presentation, you know, if they see what is happening in, in Jokowi, also I think in Central Java, and you know, to some extent also Bandu, even though that then Enrique lost, but they went with like slim coalition. They, there is hope for people with slimmer coalitions and actually to, to, to actually go get out and get, get votes out here. And so I think the hope would be from them learning from whatever is actually going on. And, and that maybe, maybe we will be able to get a real choices uh, coming in uh, 2014. And about the economic policy, is there hope for for you know better economic policy, or even like the, 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 the economic policy being part of the debate? Um, I I'm afraid that you know if he holds this number just now. What is it? Ten percent? Only ten percent of uh, people understand that all uh, the gas subsidy has to do with budget. Given the how many years this has been, you know, debated, um, it is unacceptable that the, the, that that we cannot, you know, that people cannot be made understand about about this issue. When you have, as, as, admin, as an administration, the government has all the resources to do the socialization or whatnot, to make people understand of this rational uh, choice that the government has to make. Only 10% after all these years. I think that just shows that, you know, rank, making, rank, uh, explaining to people about important economic issues are not going to be the main forte or the main narratives in the Indonesian elections. I have been in 2009, you know, in a situation, in a, in a, not in a, in a campaign, uh, listening to campaign speeches, and this is not the campaign out there, you know, in the field where people have done good and all that. You know, so this is a real discussion campaign, and the, and the, um, nominee, uh, the, the, the candidate was asked about economic issues. And he said, economic issue, we have to grow. We cannot just grow single digit. We have to grow double digit. I, if I become president, I will have 15%, up to 17% growth. And people are like, OK, like, how are we going to get 15% growth? But that's the referee, right? And there's no critical political engagement either from, from people who are actually listening to this would be 15% growth. And so I'm, I'm pessimistic that it will become part of important uh, important discussions come to the court. So it is good uh, actually to have you to comment on the, uh, on the uh, framework, especially uh, on the uh, high corruption side, uh, the political one, the political, say, uh, social uh, political factors. And uh, the second ones, I also have to remind you, this is my opinion only. So, so it's not really uh, uh, capturing the, 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 the economic uh, point of view. But uh, talking about corruptions, uh, we tend to uh, lump corruptions together uh, as if the, all kind of corruptions are the same. But uh, from economic point of view, I'm 
kind of expert on, on this uh, economic uh, and corruption. But, but, uh, as, far, uh, as, long, as far as I know, we cannot just uh, put them into one basket because there are many types of corruption with different, uh, different, uh, as a different impact to the economy. One, uh, one that uh, uh, perhaps quite, uh, uh, quite important to the economy is the corruption that that really uh, touch the uh, economy performance itself. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, those uh, 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 the examples are uh, 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 the the, the bumi, bumi or uh, or uh, the, the or high cost of the getting permit and license. Uh, uh, all those kind of things that uh, uh, that uh, 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 directly impact the economy and business sectors, but unfortunately, they are at least until now they are not under the uh, the authority uh, of the domains of Kapika. Kapika still now, uh, I think, uh, 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 with uh, with the good ratio of as well, to more focus on the high. Uh, and big corruption, high profile corruptions. The one that perhaps in, in, in the economic sectors uh, uh, has less impact to the to the smaller one uh, that happens uh, uh, in the field. And then the, 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 the although uh, it, it is also, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, this is also a, a uh, that uh, that initiative has a good research because uh, it, it can be expected that you can have a multiplier effect by uh, by focusing more on the uh, high high profile corruptions. But of course, uh, the, uh, this uh, in my framework here, uh, the impact to the economy perhaps not high because the uh, 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 always businessmen they, they are very clever. They can find ways to make a deter of those corruption. They deal with it. They they just face it as a as what it is because they have no choice. They have, they have no choice, but they put it into the cost, and then they also transfer it into the consumers and, and to the economy. So yeah, and yeah, we pay. We the ones who pay for the uh, for the uh, for all those. Uh, 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 corruptions that affect the economy. Yeah, unfortunately, the consumer has no uh, uh, has less power to uh, for the decisions. Um, so again, uh, we can we can uh, discuss about uh, about it uh, uh, again. But uh, putting putting it here uh, 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 as a minimum bigger impact to the uh, to the economy that doesn't mean that uh, high corruption is not important but uh, it, it still can uh, be uh, tickled uh, by uh, by the market but we all know about uh, equality and dualism i cannot agree more uh, uh, about that um, yes we do have uh, 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 economic dualism in Indonesia was uh, on certain part, but uh, uh, maybe maybe this is this is the big uh, big problems of uh, sorry it, uh, this is a common problems of big economies if I may say uh, like it also happens not only in Indonesia but also in China for example or in Brazil. They all have uh, uh, this two-tier economy. While the first tier is the uh, formal one that uh, that can uh, easily get uh, get the uh, transport the technology, use the new technology, and then become more and more competitive. While the the, the informal one uh, uh, stuck uh, in the uh, in the bottoms of uh, of the economy. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, this is a common problem to uh, to the uh, to uh, uh, to big economies, uh, big developing economies, in my opinion. Uh, uh, that's why, uh, while many uh, people talk uh, a bit uh, talk, talk about middle income trap, 
I think we also should introduce to Indonesia, to China, uh, to uh, uh, Brazil uh, problem, the big, big economic problem, big economic trap. While the transformation, the structural transformation, somehow did uh, stuck in the middle. The, 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 the upper, uh, the, the first tier managed to go higher, while the, the second tier remains uh, at the low level. So um, I don't have uh, any uh, prescriptions at the moment how to tackle the, the problems that we uh, I think we uh, we uh, need to pay uh, attention uh, on this uh, situation. Uh, to Pak Wahyu about the nationalisms, whether it is rational or or not the rational, uh, I guess what it means by rational, whether it has economic rational or, uh, or or not, yeah. Um, and he mentions that uh, the uh, with the uh, with the situation, the global situation is still uh, gloomy. Although we already see uh, two lights in, at the end of the tunnel, we still don't know uh, where the tunnel goes actually. Uh, so uh, it's it perhaps uh, rational to uh, to become uh, to become more inward looking and uh, more protective. Uh, but uh, we also need to uh, 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 be aware that uh, the Indonesia is uh, uh, relatively more in what we keep than other developing economies in the region. And this is not only recently. Uh, even in, before 2008, Indonesia has one of the lowest uh, uh, trade to GDP, GDP ratio among ASEAN dev, uh, emerging economies. Yeah. Uh, in, in Indonesia also was not really in the uh, in the uh, in the good positions of uh, global production chain, global value chain. We are still in the periphery, even compared to Philippines and other countries. And and uh, and. Uh, I guess, uh, while well, although it already give us uh, the, the uh, uh, blessing in disguise during the uh, during the financial crisis in 2008, we also have to remember that it also will have, will uh, uh, hold back our opportunities uh, to get uh, uh, to be in the uh, uh, to get back during the recovery the recovery time. Now, uh, uh, as you can see, many many uh, countries who, who are more uh, externally uh, exposed, they have uh, they have a big uh, 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 difficult time, big difficult time during the 2008 and 2009 up to 2010. But when the recovery happens uh, uh, after that, they already uh, managed uh, to uh, be with uh, with uh, all this. Uh, uh, New uh, recent development. So uh, I think we should choose basically which ones that uh, we need to. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think we also need to assess which one gives us more benefit compared to the other. Yes, we are. We can uh, be isolated. Uh, we can be insulated from the external shock. But it means we also cannot reap uh, the potential benefit from uh, the booming recovery time of the uh, uh, of the global economy. I think uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, this is this is uh, uh, good. Uh, this is good questions, uh, and uh, we need to look at it uh, uh, together. But uh, again, um, uh, it is good if we have the, those nationalistic uh, and uh, inward looking based on the economic rational. Unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, at the moment, most of them are just uh, politically motivated. That's what I uh, make me feel a little bit more. We still have about 15 minutes, so I can take a few more questions. Personally, see, I guess, to uh, uh, also able to 
and so uh, I am. I mean, I, I think I think I am. Yeah. Um, we we're not. You know, when I when I give give gave you the analysis of those people, you know, from 2010, 2011, from stagnating to regressing. Um, you know, while not long before that, you know, we were celebrating our democracy as, you know, as being established and not necessarily in waiting anymore and whatnot. Um, those are real development, and I think our task is, as I said in my presentation earlier, is to recognize how we got there and then find again those important elements. That were that allowed us to actually um, steer the development, the Indonesian de democracy, uh, to better, more accountable democracy. How did we get? How did we get there? How did we get uh, to have direct elections, for example, that we all have wanted, and then we managed to have them? What what was the 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 playing? You know, what was the elements that played out at that time? that allowed us to actually have that. And I think we need to recognize those things to actually push forward for for better uh, for the quality of our of our democracy. And I think you know one of the things that I said is it goes back to the Indonesian civil society. I truly believe that. Um, we as a civil societies were the ones that were really engaged at the time and I think civil society you know continue to be engaged and I think the task is actually bigger for Indonesian civil society currently because the the failure, the flaws were everywhere and it was open and you could see with naked eyes. And so um, you have an organization like FICRA, for example, trying to push forward for better transparency in the budget, but at the same time, you know, other things are going on and they try to go there as well and, and comment on that, try to fix the problems. So there's so many different issues that they have to deal with, but at the same time, I think they are our hope. They are the ones that should be supported, I guess, by us, the common people, to, to, to push forward these, the Indonesian democratic agenda. And I think, and I know it sounds flaky, you know, if I say this in, 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 you know, in this very important forum, I think all of us can do this, you know. We, I talked a little bit to Fifi about how I use the cow case all the time to talk about the relationship between corruption and our real real life, you know, what we what can or cannot be put on the table. How many grams a baby, you know, can grow depends on the protein intake and how that really relates to real life. And I think you know, if we just take the time to actually talk about this, you know, every time we go, I went to the supermarket and looked for lemons. And our lemons are tiny, but but the imported lemons are bigger. And and I talked to the person in Halo supermarket about, you know, why can't we get better produce? And I don't know. Um, you know, I think it it is dependent on all of us to continue talking about this to make those things that Jose said about corruption, uh, which is abstract, to real issues. And I think we have to do it because the media is not doing it. Not, you know, some of the medias are doing it, but the, 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 the bigger, the majority of the media cannot connect what is going on in the abstract political sphere to the reality of the people. And this makes connecting or asking for accountability that much more difficult. So not only the political parties are not doing it, the media also, as one of the very element and important pillars in democracy, is not helping us either. So uh, with all of these things, why did I say I'm optimistic? Well, because that's the only way to be. Um, I can't, you know, we can't, we can't give up just yet. We have come a long way, as you said, but, you know, this is, this is a long, a long, a long haul, and I think, you know, with the, with the, with some of the achievements that we have had, um, I think we, we can do it. Okay, uh, just so remarkable. 
we know that the next years will be uh, our election years, and uh, uh, even today, uh, people already uh, already have uh, election next year events uh, in their mind, and then uh, uh, many to no longer care about the economy. But uh, but I think so it's, uh, we uh, also still uh, pay more attention to the economy. And again, I agree with uh, uh, Sandra that the media should be uh, uh, should become one of the uh, uh, one of the pillar, one of the uh, voice for uh, more rational for more rational decision and more for more rational actions. Uh, I guess I, I should I should stop. Well, Sandra's an optimist. Uh, it seems she was saying it is one as well. So I think what we all need is a, we can be optimistic and we can be pessimistic about you know the, the, this, this whole um, ideas about um, an economic and uh, political conditions of Indonesia. But I think uh, we all want a better future for the country. Um, could you please join me for a round of applause for our two speakers? For the for a lunch break uh, and the next session um, will start again at 2 p.m. Thank you.